Thank you so much, John, for, for having us here. It's wonderful to be here with all of you and such an honor to be sitting here with you, Sir Michael, and to be able to continue the really lively conversation we started the other day um, and surrounded by these incredibly vibrant artworks that I've had so much pleasure really encountering in person for the first time over this past week. And you really do need to see them in person to appreciate them as objects, which is something that we'll be talking about the physicality of the work and of painting um, itself. And I'm sure most of you are very familiar with Michael Craig Martin's life and work. And um, we had this great biographical sketch from John. I'll just add to it uh, a little bit for those of you who may not be as familiar. Um, Michael, um, you were born in, in Dublin, Ireland, as John mentioned, not in 1841, but in 1941, um, and then grew up in Washington, D.C., or just outside the city, um, where you've spoken about the tremendous influence of American kind of post-war consumer culture, seeing the design of fins of cars, for example, and that really had an impression on you as a child. Also, another detail that I think is uh, germane to our discussion and the works we're seeing is the influence as a youth of seeing stained glass. Um, and I just think about that wonderful interplay between um, sort of sharp contouring and flat fields of color that mm -hmm. you find in stained glass. So that's something we can come back to. Um, you received your MFA from Yale University and you've spoken about the formative impact of Joseph Albers theories of color on your work. Um, his teachings were very influential during the time that you attended the program. And of course, we can absolutely see the very pivotal role that color plays in your compositions, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, you then moved to London in 1966, I believe, and your early work is marked by your sculptural practice. So really seminal works like the 1969 um, Four Identical Boxes with Lids Reversed, and then of course the groundbreaking work of conceptual art, 1973, An Oak Tree, which really explores the questions about sort of the nature and status of art and um, sort of what constitutes an artwork and an art object. And also the really um, pivotal exchanges that take place between viewers and artworks in a gallery. Um, those important relationships between an audience and your work that I think is very much a thread that we can trace throughout your um, whole body of work and that is very, uh, relevant to the works that we see here today. Um, so from there, I mean, I think it, it bears repeating what others have said, that your work has um, been associated with various key movements in, in post-war and contemporary art, um, conceptual art, minimalism, pop, but it doesn't easily fit into any of those buckets, which I think is what lends it its sort of richness and complexity. You've worked in a wide array of media, um, uh, printmaking, painting, drawing. Um, and what I want to start with in our conversation today is what you've described as the very roundabout way that you've come to painting. Um, essentially from making objects to making drawings of objects to uh, wall drawings, to sculptures of your drawings of objects, to room paintings, and then sort of full circle, here we are with your practice as a painter but you've described yourself as primarily a sculptor who makes paintings, and you've talked about your paintings as flat sculptures. So I'd just like to ask you what you mean by those statements, and also maybe walk us through this roundabout way that you've come to painting. <laughs> well, that's quite an introduction. <laughs> Where can I start? Um, <clears throat> well, I, um, my... When I went to art school, like most kids going to art school, the, f the only thing I really knew about or had any experience of was painting, and I went there to be a painter. And I was horrified, because I'd, I'd wanted to be an artist since I was about 12 years old. I got this idea of fixation, and it was, just stayed with me. And finally I got there, and then I discovered that I was really not very good at it. And I was in a school full of people who were unbelievably good at it. And 
I mean, what I mean by painting was painting, you know, paint, painterly painting. This is the early 60s, and there's still the remnants of um, abstract expressionism. And uh, the things that interest me are slightly, are they slightly different? I, I discover Albers when I get there. Um, Albers Hobbes' Square. I'm also aware of people like uh, Stuart Davis. I'm aware of Ellsworth Kelly. There are people who at that time were called hard edge artists. So that's easier for me to identify with because I know, I it's quite clear early on to me that I don't have certain facilities that come naturally to some people, which are painterly. So, the, but the early 60s is a period in which art is suddenly opened up and changing, and, and the, you, you, you can't imagine how narrow the idea of art was, even by the early 60s. Art was essentially, as it had been in Western art for centuries, essentially painting with a bit of sculpture on the side. You want the history of art, of, of Western art, it's a history of painting, and occasionally you get a really good sculptor. But, it, but you go to art school, you're, you're paint, you go to school, what are you going to do? You're not doing sculpture, in school you're doing painting. Art, art, and at that time, painting was everything. And, uh, and what happened was, suddenly that became unsatisfactory to artists, and to, and to young artists, and of course we were students at the time, and suddenly there seemed to be a possibility that there was something that was not quite sculpture, because sculpture meant bronze, carving, uh, moldy. There were, there were definitions of what was a sculpture. And suddenly that didn't make. There was a kind of making that became, seemed to be possible that was not painting and it was not sculpture. And I was there just at that moment. And for me, with my anxieties at myself about painting, it was an absolute perfect moment. I was, now this is one of the very important things about being an artist. It's called luck. I was very, very lucky. I hit this moment at exactly the right time. I was ready for it, and it was there. It was, it was the possibility was there. So, so I found myself, make, you know, making sculptures with a hand jigsaw. The whole idea of using the hand jigsaw to make sculptures seemed, at the time, it was ex something really weird to do that. But, it, but. It was immediately available, and, and, and if you look at what happens in the late 60s into the early 70s, the whole fabric of art kind of breaks open. So you can have film and performance, you can have earthworks, you can have floor pieces, you can have installations, you can... Art becomes unbelievably opened, and I think it's a crucial thing that happened. And I, in a way, I almost think it, it was a moment that rescued art, because it had become too constricted. And even, even in painting, you know, there was, those were the years when painting was defined. What was appropriate, serious painting was narrowly defined. If you didn't follow exactly certain kind of criteria, it was mm, automatically second rate. And it was so medium specific. So this feels so, like an so interdisciplinary this was, this moment. was truly an open, and, and, it, and, and basically what it, what it meant was a create, an opening of the whole idea of what creativity was. Okay, in that, I found myself, I, I, I was always very interested in the materiality of objects, and my interest started to be about objects themselves, and why is one object a sculpture and the other object isn't? Why is a chair a chair and not a sculpture? How do we know? How do we tell the difference? What is, it? what is it about one? They're both physical things. They're both objects in the world. We look at one, we look at the other. We know that's not an art object. And we so that interests me a lot. And I got interested in the idea that most art that had used real objects, including Duchamp's uh, famous fountain, the urinal, you weren't meant to pee in the in the <laughs> urine, and and I realized that one of the things that happened when things were transposed, objects were transposed into art, was that the artist removed its function. Mm -hmm. The bottle rack you don't not meant to put 
Right, and I'm thinking of Judd too. I mean, how much were you looking to his uh, yeah. writings and work? But that is something different than functionalism. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, uh, and but everything, and uh, uh, but I mean, that th that as the aspect of minimalism was very important because it was so factual. It was about this is what it is. Right. It is what it is, and that that clicked for me immediately. I really like the, the thing, many things about pop art. Oh, but the thing that most touched me about pop art was the way it reached such an enormous audience. There hadn't been an art for so long that spoke to both very uh, sophisticated people and very unsophisticated people. That you really, you needed, if you knew a lot about art, you got a lot out of it. If you knew very little, it gave you a lot too. And that's something, you know, which, to me, I look back to Renaissance art. You go to, back to the, the great artists of the Renaissance. They have that kind of thing. You know, I mean, I, I often think, you know, imagine if you were in the 14th, 15th century, uh, you're an ordinary person, which basically means you're a peasant, you're illiterate, you have, there's no such things as books or anything in your life, you know, you never see an image. You go to it, the, possibly you see an image a couple of times a day by coins. There's a face on a coin, that's it. Where else are you gonna see an image? You walk into church, oh my God, there is this, is this wonderment and this, uh, these incredible uh, narratives from the Bible, from the Psalms, uh, which, which were stories that everybody knew. So every simple person knew the code of how to read them, but there was this incredible expression. So it, again, it was available to the most sophisticated person as a sophisticated experience and to a simple person. On a and you've talked about that idea of readability, of the accessibility and readability of your work. And I think this is clearly <laughs> apparent agree, in, in, in the works that we see here. What's fascinating is at the same time you complicate that notion. So we can walk in and immediately understand that we're looking at an image of a trainer, of a shoe, of a bunch of grapes, of a camera. But the more time you spend with the images, you're aware of the strangeness of your understanding of them and of the representation of them. So you're kind of complicating these ideas of um, perception or you're really asking the viewer to, to think, you're sort of startling the viewer into thinking about the very act of perception. So, uh, th yeah. yes, th that's, that's absolutely the key to what, what I try to do. I mean, I do, you can see, I do a work which is aggressively obvious in terms of subject matter. But people's understanding of art th only through subject matter is the greatest mistake that people make. Art is, the, the subject matter is a distraction, usually, and it certainly is in, I'm, I'm really interested in these things in a sense, and they're not actually of no interest to me at all in another sense. My interest is in how is an image perceived? How do you, what is it, what happens when you take an object, you take a shoe, which has its three-dimensional reality, and you know what it's for, and you wear it. And then we have this miraculous ability to turn to create a flat picture of the thing. And we look at that, and we see. That, and when we look at it, we don't first say picture; we first say shoe. It's so powerful to us. So every one of these images, I'm wanting you. I'm using what you know. And but when I, but my premise is that this incredible gift of being able to read images, we learn it as infants, and we learn it so naturally, so easily, we don't realize how unbelievably extraordinary it is and how sophisticated it is about what it allows to do. All of the, all writing, hieroglyphics, um, Chinese script, all started with pictograms. It all started with making images of things. It then dissolves into uh, symbolic abstractions, but they start from, everything starts with pictures. And that's, 
And so in a sense, what I'm trying to do is make you self-conscious of the act of turning it into a picture. Uh, that's, that's why they're so assertive, was to say, this is how a picture is made. And all the things I've done, I've taken things where I take a single image and put it in the middle of a canvas. I, I take an image and I fracture it at the edge, because you can fracture an edge. I make a thing bigger than life, I make a thing smaller than life, I put things together in ways I, you know, I've, if you can look around, I've, I've played with ev every one of these things as a, 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 a device which, two, which turning something into two dimensions allows. And the first thing, that, one of the things that happened to me was for the first 10 or 15 years of doing this, I only did it in drawings and I didn't use color. And then there was a moment when I first used color and the thing that floored me was the audience response to the color. It was so overwhelming, um, their pleasure and their emotive response to the work. I had never had that response before. So then I realized, and, and you know, in a sense, I've, been, I've kind of pieced together the whole experience of, of making pictures because I, you know, as I said, I, you know, I end up with painting, but I, but I also, uh, I start with drawing and then I'm trying to use all the possibilities of painting and I haven't used color. And then you use color and then, of course, color is the key experience. So you've said that color specifies the image, exactly. which I think is a wonderful and, phrase. And you see, I, you see if, if, if I have uh, uh, you know, any object that's made out of two or three materials, we, the material, we understand the material difference between leather, wood, paper, cloth, right? In paint, that's the difference between pink and red and blue and green. That is how you describe physical difference. In a Rembrandt painting, the difference between flesh, a ruffled lace collar, and a velvet jacket is the color. That's how he does it. That's what art, that's what art does. And so this transformation and the way, the, the, in a, so in a sense, so the, the physicality of painting is not just the physicality of the paint, the color itself is part of the physical character of painting. And, and I love that you just used the word transformation to describe your process and what you're doing here. Because at, at one time you said, I, I just record things. And certainly your drawing practice, um, where you compiled, I think, over 200, a compendium of over 200 drawings of everyday objects. And the approach has been the same since the late 1970s. It's a very um, consistent and seemingly very sort of straightforward and simple approach. But it seems to me, and I think to you as well, that you enact a series of transformations as these compositions kind of move across these various media and the introduction of color, um, the way that you're playing with scale, cropping. I mean, I've been noticing a lot the really radical cropping that you use in some of these compositions. All of this really engenders um, a sense of, I think, wonderment in the viewer, that idea of kind of startling us out of our um, kind of um, typical reception of the everyday. It was one of the things that we were saying, we were talking the other day, and I, I was saying that um, most, to me, uh, when I first started to do the, image, draw, the idea of drawing things, it was very unfashionable in art for artists to make images, representational images. Uh, paintings were basically um, uh, abstract, mo abs and, and, in, and in a sense, in a modern sense, objects themselves. And if you wanted an image, you used a photograph. Photographs, photography was the one acceptable way in which you could have an image. So then I start to draw th things. I, I'm not just drawing, I'm drawing things. It's about the worst thing you can, can do. Um, but that, that seemed to me to be uh, a, a way of, of trying to open up this question about how, how does the whole thing work? How does it, what is the play between the viewer and the object? And one of the things that's that is in these works is, I was saying, I only draw things you recognize. I never draw anything you don't know what it is. If you don't, if you don't all instantly know what it is, 
I've lost you. You have to know it without even thinking about it. You have to know it. You look at the picture and you don't say, mm, I think it's this. No, you got to look at it and just like that. You got to know because the pictures only work because of your familiarity with the objects that I've painted. But then having that familiarity and that instant recognition then allows you to spend some time with the composition and just really connect with the, the surrealism or the strangeness of the fact that you're looking at an abstraction, an idea of an object. I'm looking at the bunch of grapes. Yeah. They're grapes, but they're also clusters of shapes, you know, circles with bold outlines. Um, I, for some reason, I keep coming back to these marvelous symbols across the way here in this uh, musical composition, um, which are recognizable again instantaneously, but it's a very odd, uh, you know, we talked about the form in the, in the Holbein, um, in the Ambassadors, which you've depicted. This idea, um, and I, that's an interesting point I wanted to get to, is you have rendered great masterworks from the history of art, um, but including the Ambassadors, including Las Meninas, uh, including Warhol soup cans, and maybe a common thread between these works is that they too are really questioning the nature of perception or there's perceptual um, oddities in the compositions, if I could yeah. phrase it that way. Yes, there's, I'm drawn to certain kinds of old, and old masters and, and I think uh, we live, uh, this, uh, this part of me, you know, I'm, I'm gotten so old now and I, I think uh, uh, history seems to matter less or be less accessible for some reason to people. They don't feel it. I mean, I saw myself when I was a student and we all saw ourselves as, as stepping into an ongoing tradition. We were going to have our moment in this tradition. The tradition started hundreds of years before us, and our aim in life was to, to play our, if we could play a little part in this ongoing thing, that would be fantastic. I think it's much harder for young people to have that sense of continuity, of connectedness with the past that seemed to seem natural to us at that time. And you know, you speak to so many young people who. The, you know, the past is anything past the year 2000. It's, it's the kind of almost, you know, the dark ages. It's kind of almost unimaginable what happened before then. And um, uh, I did, I did uh, speak to somebody recently, um, and I was talking about going to art school in the 1960s, and she said, there were art schools in 1960? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's, a, that's, that's a, a both horrifying and a, and a great segue. I mean, you know, I think I, I would be remiss to not point to the tremendously influential role that you've played as a teacher, of course, at Goldsmiths College in London, shaping a generation of British conceptual artists, the young British artists, famously Damien Hirst, Sarah Lucas. Um, and, I sense in your words that, that you really do have a, a passion for um, helping young people, young artists, kind of find their way and connect with. I, I do, I do, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I think I obviously have some kind of natural ability in that. But it's, I never meant to be a teacher, and I don't like to think of my work as didactic in any way. Um, but I did get, when I was teaching, I did get fascinated by the idea. I'm, I'm very anti-hierarchical and anti-specific. To me, the, the, the great gift of art is absolute diversity. There art, it is an art everywhere in every single person. Every one of them is different. Every art is always, to me, an expression of somebody's somebody's experience of the world mm -hmm. and and everybody's experience is that we're, is we're all I we're all so much the same and we're all slightly different and that difference that's where art comes from mm -hmm. and so um, when I was teaching what came to fascinate me was how different my students were and how to give them the confidence in their own uniqueness 
And one of the odd things about people that I discovered is that people often undervalue the thing they're best at because for them it's easy. The thing you're good at is, a, you know, and let's face it, learning, we've all taught from the time we're little kids, learning is difficult. There has to be a bit of pain involved. And if there's not, you can't possibly, it, you're not making an effort. So, it, so that can't be important. If it comes to you too easily, it's not valued. And a lot of what I became involved with was trying to get people to value their own, you, the thing that they were drawn to, the thing they were good at, the thing, because otherwise you spent your whole life trying to be good at something that somebody else is naturally good at. It was like me, I, if I could have spent my whole life trying to become that kind of painter I wasn't, and boy, would that have been a waste of time. Yeah, you know? no, absolutely. I, you, I, you can't do it. I could never be somebody else. I could only be who I am. And so you have to find, you have to gain, and so a lot of it is to gain confidence, but also to, to acknowledge in yourself what it is that you, and, it, and making art is essentially based in pleasure. And you know, if, if, if it's not pleasant at some level to do, it doesn't mean it's not hard work, it's got to be, but it has to be a pleasure. How are you going to sustain a life doing that? It's not possible, it's not humanly possible. So it's kind of a process of self-discovery yes. more than anything. Yes, it is. And, and, and you, I always describe it as somebody finding their voice. And some people take a very long time to find their voice, and other people amazingly find it very young. The people I, there was a group of people I taught who were all 20 years old, around 20 years old, and they found their voice really young and they were able then to build that into success. Do you think we're at a moment in terms of artistic education, because you mentioned that there, there isn't sort of a dominant paradigm and that there's much more of an openness to a whole range of styles. I mean, do you think in a way that it would be easier as an artist to make one's way now in that kind of climate where you don't have, you know, Clement Greenberg <laughs> breathing down your neck? I think, I think it was easier before. I mean, it was more difficult and easier. When, when, when you can't have radicality without orthodoxy. Mm. We don't have any orthodoxy anymore. Therefore, we're not going to have any radicality because you can't, how can you be radical in a situation where everything is permitted? Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a non- There's nothing it's to push nonsense. against. There's, yeah. no, there's nothing to push against. There's nothing to do that's wrong. That's forbidden. That's you know, and so I think that makes it very difficult. I think that makes it very difficult. And it, it just thinking about that idea of pushing against a, a paradigm. Um, in terms of the arc of your own career and the various permutations that your work has taken, it strikes me that there's a process of sort of pushing against or questioning. Um, an approach or um, a, um, a medium that you've worked in before. So for, I mean, the kind of predominant tension that you find between two and three dimensionality across your work, which I think is fascinating and I'd love to talk about more. Moving from the sculptures to the drawings of objects and then to these sort of environmental installations with drawings where you've even said a room painting is for a viewer, an experience of walking into a painting, your sculptures that you've created based on your drawings of objects, which have such a two-dimensional quality. I mean, if you see them in profile, it's like you're looking at a line. They're, they're drawings in space. So is there a sense that you're sort of constantly perhaps questioning or pushing up against what you've just done? Or how does, how does that tension sort of play out in your own well, I mean, as, as in the first part of my uh, work, I, as I said, I used real objects. I, I, some, some things I made objects, and sometimes I used existing objects. And then in the late 80s, I had this thought to, to, to make images of things, and I didn't really know quite 
I didn't have an idea. I've never had an agenda. I don't have, I never had a plan. I never had something I was trying to get at or something. I had certain thoughts, of course I had certain thoughts about what I'm doing, but see where it takes me. And that's, what, that's how everything I've done has happened. That, and every time I've thought, every, I've, I've been through every door there is in this thing that I'm doing. <laughs> And suddenly, just as I'm about to think, oh, that's it, another door opens. I see some other possibility. In the, you know, mm-hmm. And I've gone through the other door. And so the thing has, the thing has unfolded for me. And um, I mean, one of the things that, you know, that the, the sculptures, which are just, they're made in metal and they're just, they're line drawings. And what's, you see, because what, 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 what really interests me is two dimensionality. And so I'm the artist of two-dimensionality. So even my sculptures are two-dimensional. Mm. And, uh, you know, so when you read one of my sculptures, if, if you look at uh, Michelangelo's David, it take, he takes the form of a human figure and you associate what you're looking at with, with what you know of the physics, because he's imitating the actual form of the human figure. You look at my sculpture of an umbrella, it doesn't look anything like an umbrella. It's, it's just flat lines, and, uh, you know, and, and yet you look at it because I've, it's, a, it's a sculpture of a drawing of an umbrella. It's not a sculpture of an umbrella. It's a sculpture of a drawing. So you read it as two, uh, in two-dimensional terms, and in two-dimensional terms it's very easy to read. Right, and it's comple- your understanding of the image is also completely, of the object, is also completely contingent on your shifting relationship to it. You can move around it and experience all these different um, sort of uh, um, kind of volume or flatness depending on where you're standing in relationship to it. So again, it's that exchange between the viewer and the artwork. I, I think this question, as I've tried to say, for me, it's always been about the viewer, the, the role of the viewer. I mean, it's, a, it, it's an, uh, obviously an, a famous uh, understanding about art as a negotiation between the viewer and the artist through an object. And that was really what the oak tree was trying to do, trying to, try, trying to play this. And, that, and that's what I've, uh, I'm tr- I've tried to do that with everything. That's, uh, and I, uh, it, it, does make sense to me for them to be no, to make, on the one hand, I make everything exactly as I want, I don't care about any of you, and on the other hand, to make something without a sense of of being an audience is meaningless to me. If I wanted to stay home and make paintings and nobody looks, that's okay. I don't mind people do that, but that's not, to me that's not really art. Art Art is a social activity. Right, and then you think about the work you've done with sort of more um, environmental installations, with the wall drawings, with the room paintings, with curatorial work um, at the RA, you know, um, really sort of being involved in how artworks are shown. Um, your work with Herzog and de Meuron for the Lubbock Dance Center, and of course I gravitated towards that because I work at the De Young, which is designed by them. So, you know, do you think of yourself as kind of a, an installation artist, or um, you're clearly the, I mean, I'm sure this is true of most artists, but the environment in which your works are shown is tantamount, is, is very important to um, how they're received. Yes, I mean, I, I've tried, I don't, I mean, no artist likes to be defined by a you know, pop art, bin more. Artists, artists don't really like, don't like that, which is understandable. And I don't fit into. I think I'm very maverick. I don't think I fit into any easy category, at all, which suits me fine. And I, and to be honest, I think some of the people that I've taught are not easily defined either. I don't think it's easy to categorize Damien Hirst. Right. I think he's a maverick artist, and you know, and I think I have something. To do, I kind of legitimize. I've I've been very good at legitimizing other people's practices. Um, uh, people, uh, as one of my students said that I that what I did was I gave permission, mm. and it's an interesting idea because of course nobody needs permission, but it's also very useful if somebody gives it to you. Right, <laughs> it's a little wind. But you don't actually need wind it. beneath your feet. Yeah, yeah. and so. 
but uh, the, the, the thing about the, the installations is, of course, as you said, about, you know, like walking into a painting, about engulfing people mm. in, in experience. And, that, you know, and I would like you to walk up to that painting and be engulfed by it for the moment. Well, and I, I, yeah. One of the things that we talked about also was that um, most uh, artists who use representation, that most representations are reputa representations of experience the artist had, which you are not having, you have it through what they're giving you. If there's a landscape, you're not in the landscape, the artist was, the artist makes a representation of the landscape, and you experience the landscape through them. In my pictures, there was no landscape. There was no pre, these, these, these do not record a previous experience. The, the, the only experience of them is the one you're having right this minute. They do not refer to an experience I had that you didn't. And they are physical objects, as you've really emphasized, the, the physicality of the visual, that, that they are, there's an objectness. The painting is itself, it's it. It, it's, it is, it yeah. is yes. I, I don't make banjos, I, do, I make paintings. And, um, uh, the, the, and I'm trying to make, I'm trying to make a painting that is as potent an object as the banjo is, even though it's not a banjo, even though it looks like a banjo, <laughs> even though you think it. And maybe we could talk a little bit about the choices that you make to enact these um, transformations and, and engender these experiences in the viewer. I mean, I was struck uh, just before we sat down in thinking about the simplicity of the forms, but at the same time, that's in tension with certain, you know, areas that feel quite detailed. And, and you know, thinking about the grooves mm. on the bottom of mm -hmm. the shoes, for example. Um, you know, how do you make decisions about what details, for example, to really work or highlight versus the the streamlined qualities of other areas of the composition. I try to put in as much detail as my technique of drawing allows. There's certain things I've never been able to draw because, I mean, I've never been able to draw a comb. There'll be too many, too many vertical lines. But I think you've drawn a plate of spaghetti, or? I have drawn a, that took, it took a year. Uh, so, it was, I won't do that again. But, but, it, it, so there's certain, there's certain things I feel able to draw and certain things that are not. It was, uh, it, it was quite easy to draw the trumpet. It was very difficult to find a way to draw the saxophone. If you know what a musical instrument looks like, you know particularly wind instruments are staggeringly complex with the vowels and the tubes and this coming down. I've, I've tried to give you a, I don't want it to look like a cartoon. I don't want it to be, look like abbrevi abbreviation. I don't want you to look at it and think he's giving us an idea. I want, you to, I want it to be as close to the real thing in detail as I can get it. But there's a certain amount of detail I can't, I can't get. And the, the fact that I always draw everything but the same line I mean, none, there are no lines in nature, and there are no lines in any of these objects. It is a total invention, the line. Mm. And what's really weird is that the, our way of, my way of making what seems like the most realistic image of an object is to just draw it by outline, when in fact, it is the most artificial way of representing it because there are no lines. There are absolutely no lines anywhere in the things that we have. They don't exist. And so uh, there's no lines in us, there's no lines in trees, there's no lines anywhere. Hmm. And so, uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible artifice. And I, I do think that it's very important to uh, understand and to recognize the, the importance of that, the, of art as artifice. Mm, absolutely. And that, um, I mean, I, you know, the, uh, when I think when the cavemen were doing pictures of a bison on the walls of caves, it must have been so incredible to them because they had realized, first of all, that they could do it, 
but also they could make the bison that big. Mm. Now, that's a leap of imagination if a bison is gigantic. <laughs> but you can make it that, and you still know it's a bison. It's not a little bison. And it's an abstraction, fundamentally. And it's, 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 it's an abstraction. abstraction. <clears throat> yeah. And yet there's enough there that the presence of the bison has been conjured without the bison being present. Yeah. And that's exactly the same here. It's exactly the same. Yeah, it, and the, the tensions between flatness and depth, I think, are particularly, because really, fundamentally, these are very flat artworks, but you have, you know, an interplay between foreground and background, and particularly in the compositions where there's overlapping forms, mm -hmm. you feel that. And we spoke the other day about Stuart Davis, who really popped into my head, especially when I was looking at your compositions of musical instruments, because my mind went to Davis's marvelous um, uh, depictions or evocations of jazz mm -hmm. with their, you know, incredibly vivid colors and sort of cacophony of, of forms um, that evoke that, that sense of sound and energy. And I guess I'm not quite sure where I'm going with that. Maybe you could riff on that a little <laughs> since we're talking about jazz, but also this idea of, because I think the musical um, objects are fairly new for you. This is a yes, new I, uh, body of work. I, mean, I can tell you that. I mean, I, I did draw a few musical instruments, which I think said guitars and things. And then I got a commission to do a dinner service for a great house in England. And um, they wanted me to do a full, a big dinner service. And uh, so I wanted to have an image, images for the plates and cups and all the things. And I, but I thought, I don't want them to just be different things. They should, so I suddenly realized if, they, if I made them all musical instruments, it gave a single form to the set. And at the same time, everyone could be different. So then I needed to start drawing musical instruments, which I'd only drawn a few of before, so I drew, I drew more and more. So that's where, that's where the musical instruments came. But the musical instruments are very, are very interesting because I never draw things that aren't new. I don't really draw antiques. And I don't draw anything that's broken. I don't draw anything that's worn out. I don't do... I want everything to look perfect, everything to be, everything is new. I mean, I want them to look like they're, they are when you buy them. And the things we buy, the things we make for ourselves, they're all manufactured, and manufacturing produces, to have repetition, you have perfection. My drawings are not more perfect than the drawing I've drawn, than the object I've drawn, they're just in the same vein. And I don't want them to be personal in that sense. So just like when I buy an iPhone, it, my iPhone's the exact same as your iPhone, but it's very personal for a different reason. And you can't have mine, and I don't want yours, because they're personal. But the thing, the object itself is identical and perfect. And so it, it seems to me, yeah, I've got lots of my track. Well, I think what I was wondering with these compositions of musical objects is obviously there's this overarching interest in the nature of perception that you explore throughout your work, um, but really focused, I think, on visual perception. Um, but of course, these objects conjure other kinds of perceptual um, notions and 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 perhaps lead to other kinds of inquiry. So I was just wondering if you were thinking at all about sort of synesthesia or um, from maybe a more interdisciplinary perspective about human perception. It, it was difficult to paint lots of musical instruments without thinking of music. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, there's a very definite difference of musicality in between the wind instruments and the string instruments. And I wanted to try to express that it through the color that so that there's different color worlds for each of the pictures and which are the diff, which are the equivalent of the difference between the sets of images uh, sets of objects the the thing i was going to say about music which is so interesting is everything i draw is new so are all these musical instruments but the musical instruments have been the same for centuries 
They're the only objects I draw which are, I, might, I could draw an 18th century violin, it looks exactly, you'd hardly tell the difference between that and one today. And these are the only objects we have that exist right through centuries without changing, which is really extraordinary. You look at all the instruments in the orchestra, and that nearly all the instruments have been more or less the same. It almost speaks to the perfection of the design. It yes. doesn't uh, uh, need clearly, to be improved clearly, on. Clearly, if there was yeah. a possibility of improving on them, people would have improved on them. You know, I have added the electric guitar, because that, that's what, our one improvement. But other than that... Hmm. Which is quite but different. That's in, but that's in, that to me, that's very interesting. And I, I like the idea that there are, these, there are a few objects. The other one is the umbrella. The umbrella is a kind of 19th century, it's, it's an, the one we use is a kind of 19th century invention. Uh, but it, they have, nobody's improved on that really, there's different varieties of how they open and things like that, but it's all essentially the same. So that's another, that's one of the other few objects which has maintained its form. Unlike the technologies that you've depicted over the years, which as I think you've noted, kind of provide a record of our shifting relationship uh, to them. So kind of tracing the move from analog to digital technologies, mm -hmm. for example, because you've been drawing them since 1978, I believe. So um, there you really see this kind of rapid evolution in terms of design and use. And I think that's fascinating. But then of course, technology also plays a role in your process. So. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that, for example, how um, you use it for color selection and other aspects of kind of how you make your compositions. And then I also, maybe we'll just start there and I can layer on okay. top of that. When, when I first started to draw, I, I started to draw every object individually. And I drew them on A4 paper, which is like American letter paper, size paper. And I drew each object the size of the paper and I drew it with very thin tape. I, just found, I discovered this tape which was flexible, so it allowed me to draw with tape. I liked it because it was, it was always perfect and it was impersonal. I, I didn't want hand inflection. I, as I said, I wanted the character of the fabricated object. It's like object. the antithesis of abstract expressionism. No Ab sign of the artist's absolute, hand. Absolute, <laughs> yeah. eliminate it. Um, and uh, so uh, f and then so I and I did the, the tape drawings on clear acetate. So to make to make a drawing from the drawings, I used the draw the original drawings as templates. So I would use the same image again and again. I would combine them in different groups to make more complex images. Blah, blah, blah. And I did that for about ten years, and then I got a computer. And I got the first computer. Uh, it was an Apple computer. It was a very early Apple computer. And I got it for word processing because I did some writing and I realized that I learned about cut and paste. And cut and paste was exactly how I'd always written. I could never sit down and write something continuously. I always wrote in chunks and then juggled the chunks. And that's it. So, so cut and paste was made for me. So I got that. <laughs> and then I realized that's kind of the way I draw. <laughs> and I hadn't noticed it. So then I first scanned in all of the line drawings that I'd done over the years uh, with the, on, uh, on acetate. The thing about having a, a, a template in acetate was I could never make anything a different size. I had to make another template. That's very tedious. And so, but once I got the, the image into the computer, I could take the image and make it bigger, smaller, and then I just, but then of course they were very heavily pixelated at the time because the technology was quite crude. And then I discovered vector images and vector images gives you a perfect line. And that line also means you can, you can enlarge the line itself. So, you could, so suddenly I had a tool, and it was as though I'd been working for 10 years waiting, when are they going to get that computer here because I need it, I need it immediately. It's as though I was waiting, and, and then everything I've done from the early 90s to now, I think it was, would have been impossible without the computer, absolutely impossible. Because what I do, you can tell, you can't make pictures like this without planning everything beforehand. 
I, I can make certain color changes of, at, at the end if, I've, if I think I've made a mistake, but basically, you can't change the drawing. Once the drawing is done, that's it. And so they have to be heavily planned. So on the computer, I do 20, 30 drawings for every painting. Everyone is slightly different. Everyone is an improvement on the last. I can go back to the first one and see, maybe it was better than the last one. No. It, so the computer has been critical to what I do. I don't, I don't do anything funny on the computer. The thing I use is so stupid. I do the simplest thing. I don't do anything for effects. I never use Photoshop for anything. I never use any of the fancy things that you can use. They don't interest me. I just use the very simple thing that it does. And it's the same now that I was doing with them when I started. What about the translation of the sort of map or the plan that you work out on the computer to the actual physical object, to the painting on aluminum, which is, you know, mm -hmm. I'd love to talk about your use of that support. Um, was it a challenge or did it take some adjustment to conceive of how the image as you saw it on the screen would feel in an object form in, in real life? Or how do you make those well, kind of the, determinations? From the very first acetate drawings, what I did with the very first acetate back in the 70s was I would make a composition, then take a 35 millimeter slide of that and project the slide mm. and do the drawing on the wall large. It was a simple technology and it worked absolutely fine. Uh, so the idea of, of working on something which gives you something else and, then you, that, and, that, and you end up with a final product which is not any of its immediate stages, that was very familiar to me. Um, the thing about the, uh, the computer was that it allowed me, for instance, to, of course, to, then when I came to adding color, suddenly I had the whole world at my disposal in terms of color because I could make all the color decisions early. I mean, before I had, before arriving at, at action of, of turning it into a work. And um, so again, all the, I, I mean, I've always been interested in uh, technologies as enablers, um, but then I think artists always have. Of course, absolutely. Um, and I think Hockney's analysis yeah. into the um, old master's use of technologies is a perfect case sure. in point. Um, what about the aesthetic of technologies and the sort of changing aesthetic of technologies? You know, we talked a bit about this the other day, but the flatness of digital imagery of an iPhone, they're getting they're shrinking. <laughs> the profiles are, are, you know, getting more and more two dimensional. Mm -hmm. um, the way that UX designers um, array apps on a screen. I mean, there's, it seems to me there's that similarly strange kind of um, uh, tension uh, between two and three dimensionality that is, is a little bit of a visual puzzle, if you will. Well, when I started drawing in the 70s, it was still, we were uh, analog age. And in the, most of the 20th century, the, 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 the design theme was form follows function. A thing is supposed to look like what it does. And you should look at, be able to look at an object and knew what it did. And I always give the example, the most obvious one was the telephone. Remember the telephone? That was an old fashioned thing. It had a handle and it had a bit here and a bit here, and you held it up here, and this bit was right near your mouth, the other bit was right near your ear, and you listened in here, and you spoke in here, and somehow it went down the wire, and we didn't know how that happened. <laughs> and it, but it worked, it, we understood, you could, it was an absolute visualization of what, what was it happening. did, yeah. Now we have this. Where do you speak? And, and this, I might where add, you, which is miniature. You, where do you listen? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's also a computer, it's a camera, it's, a, it's 25 objects, 30 objects, 40 objects in one, and it's totally bland. The, it's a boring, bland object, and it's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle. And so there's been a change in the whole nature of objects. 
in the last 30 years. This is not a minor change. This is now things, it's completely unnecessary and for anybody to even think in terms of form following function. I mean, just it's, it's almost nonsensical. You don't need to do that. Uh, if anything, probably best to avoid it. And so but I'm, I'm also very reminded, when I, was, when I was a student, we were very influenced by certain people and one of the people we thought a lot about and we admired enormously was Buckminster Fuller. Mm. And Buckminster Fuller said in the 50s that the nature of technologies was to make everything simpler and simpler and simpler. Mm. And that every stage of technology made the previous things. He was right. He was really right. I mean, it's amazing thing that's happened with, with these things. And so, I, I, again, and there's also something interesting. When I first started, my idea of, of ordinary objects was cheap objects. You know, objects that anybody could own because they were cheap. Now, if you want to draw an object, I have to do one that costs you $1,000. <laughs> but everybody's got one. So what is ordinary anymore? You know, even ordinary has changed. But it is commonplace. But it it's is, totally commonplace. Yeah. This is a... And absolutely, it, you, you, you have, if you don't acknowledge this as a commonplace object, you know, I mean, so I, I get even our idea of what constitutes ordinary has changed. And the, the question of the nature of, of value and it, you know, all those things. There's another one which you see a lot in, in, in some of these things, the question of branding. I mean, uh, I'm not interested in uh, selling trainers for people, but I mean, one has to say, to 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 make this shoe without the logo, the, without the logo, yeah, it's not the shoe. To make the phone, that's not, I don't. It's not just a phone. It's an iPhone. That you can't do them anymore without acknowledging the consumer the, the consumer aspect and, yeah. the, and the branding the branding has become part of the nature of the object itself that was not true in the past which is an abstraction in and of itself in, in and our reception of that information is a form of abstraction or making sense from an abstraction you can, and you can certainly see that it makes a lot of sense commercially to make something where part of the nature of the object is your is your it is the object is your own logo right <laughs> and that's obviously we need marks in the room I think commercial, commercially very sensible but but so you know and so something I would I, I would might have avo tried to avoid years ago I've given up I think you, I can't you can't doesn't make sense to do that so I now I just accept this is what the way things are so are you still finding new objects to draw and building out that 200 plus repertoire? You're, 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 you're wrong about the 200. Oh, is we're, it? We're, where are we we're, at? We're up about 800 now. Oh my, oh, I, okay. I thought, I thought there would be more. I mean, I haven't been doing it since 1978. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I, it's interesting. The vast amount of objects are variations of objects. Most objects are variations of a, of a comparatively small number. Um, uh, one of the objects, the most interesting objects of which I've drawn many, are chairs. Chairs are really interesting objects because they've been made out of every single material that you can possibly think of. There is, I cannot think of a material that somebody has not made a chair out of. We, chairs don't have to look anything like each other, and yet, so long as it's got the basic, mm -hmm, we know it's a chair. And it, it's a kind of infinite source of design possibility. We had a great and, display of chairs at the De Young uh, that you? had well, you recently was, come down. I'm sorry, you might have but enjoyed then, it. But then you know, yeah. if, if, they're, if they're just amazing. And I've drawn dozens of chairs because they're, they're, there's so many interesting chairs and I, you know, I think one of my life's failings will be never to have designed a chair. <laughs> I, would, would have thought, I would have thought it was one of the world's greatest achievements was well, to come up with a new chair. Well, I was going to ask you about <laughs> projects on the horizon, so, you know, that could be. 
Um, but as I said, I only draw I have pictures of chairs. I don't draw. I don't make chairs. <laughs> but I, but I do think that's a you know there are certain things that seem like to me amazing design challenges. And anybody who comes up with a chair that people recognize, that people want, that you see, that's an amazing thing. Well, they're also wonderful carriers of aesthetic and socio-historical meaning. Yeah. I mean, it's a perfect example of where um, you know function and artistry and cultural context kind of come together. Um, you know, thinking of a shaker chair versus a Rococo yeah, chair. Yeah, or, yeah they're, they're you know. amazingly expressive. And, yeah. And, and, and their materi material differences. Amazing. There was something, this is a, this is a side, but there, uh, something I always like to say, that we, we were going back to old master paintings and paintings from the past. Um, uh, I've told the story. When I was a student, I had a, a very good artist tutor who, and I said to him one day, I'd been to, uh, it's probably in New York, or maybe I'd been to the Met or something, and I said something to him about how I'd seen these wonderful old master paintings and how they cast one, they gave one a kind of vision of the past, a window into the past. And he said, no, 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 no. they don't. He said, that's not what they do. What happens when you look at an old painting and you respond to it as art, you pull it into the present. Mm. And I think that is so wonderful as an explanation of why a painting that's 500 years old can be a living thing. When you turn it into art, when you look at it as art, not like an antique, but you look at it as art, it becomes alive. And to be alive, it's you doing it. Again, mm. it's the audience. It's the audience doing it. I, I've always thought that was a wonderful, wonderfully useful way of looking at, at the things of the past. Yeah, and, and I think as we discussed um, the other day, just the idea that the really great kind of canonical works of art are really less about the subject matter or as much about the subject as they are about the act of representation and that that's what draws you to them is that you're aware of the complexities of this act of making and representing that the artist has put him or herself into. Yes, I mean, you know, again, if you go back to the paintings, uh, the religious paintings of the Renaissance, the, the religious scenes depicted may be of v little understood today and of little uh, religious meaning to most people or to many people, um, but the paintings themselves can still be alive in other ways and in, in human terms and uh, uh, they, they maintain their life. Uh, regardless, again, because it's not the subject matter that matters. It's not, the subject matter is not the critical issue. Yeah, it's the way that they're constructed. It's the way, constructed. That, the way that they have been, in, the, the interpretation of this into this, the nature of the object you're looking at. And I, uh, I think it's very, oh, it's always, always very important to remember that works of art only exist as, as specifics. The, to talk about painting is a bit is misleading. There's that painting, they're one at a time. You can't make paintings. You make one, you make another, you make another. Uh, they exist as individual, as individual things. So much of life has to do with generalizing things. And the thing about works of art that's so important to seems to me is that they're so specific. Yeah, and, and getting back to this idea of the sort of physicality of the painting of the object, you've talked about how when, when you're making something, it's yours, but once it's finished, it's, 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 or it's maybe it's the viewers, right? It's whatever it is itself, and then it's also what transpires between the viewer and it, that and, kind of, which and, is a living thing. And that, and that is, that, that varies from person to person. I mean, talking about the subject matter, I know that people's response to my work is very often uh, um, dictated by the subject. If a person is interested in musical instruments, they'll like the musical instrument paintings more than somebody who isn't, or somebody who plays the banjo is really going to go for that picture, or it's going to engage them in some kind of way that's different. It will depend a lot on on what you bring to it. 
and I give so little away, give so little information, they're so nominal. I'm just trying to leave room for you to bring all this stuff that we all carry. I don't tell you what size a thing is, what it's made out of, what it looks like from the other side, how big it is, how much it cost, and yet you look at any one of these things and you know all that. I didn't tell you, because they're not in the picture, it's not in the picture. You're already carrying it. I'm conjuring it by giving you the image, but I'm, but I'm not giving it to you. You're bringing it, not me. I, I loved a, a discussion that I um, watched uh, you have where you talked about the really formative influence of seeing an atlas, a color atlas, when you were a young boy, and just this whole idea of maps and mapping, which of course is a very abstract mode of representing, which involves flat fields of color and demarcating lines, and I mean, you can almost think of these works as maps, right? Mm -hmm. You're mapping uh, objects for viewers to make meaning from the fields of color and the demarcating mm -hmm. lines that are on the mm -hmm. um, support. So um, I thought that was a really interesting <coughs> idea. Maps, maps are very definitely drawings of that, an attempt to draw something which is all virtually undrawable. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, and then also I was struck, I mean, in perhaps you can talk a little bit about your choices here, but in some of the compositions, the objects really fill the space aggressively, I think is, is a term you've used, I think it's appropriate, that they, and they appear to kind of project into our space, even though they're resolutely flat at the same time, but others, you know, just sit sort of in a more centralized way, um, flatly on on the um, support. So how do you make those decisions? Why is the camera, you know, in my face and the shoe is not, or I how? have no idea. Yeah, it's just kind of instinctual. <laughs> I, I just, uh, sometimes, it, uh, it's just what occurs to me at the time that I'm, you kind of feel that it. I'm doing it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, the, the breakthrough with me with color was realizing that anything could be any color. And that I did, it didn't have to have anything to do with the thing that you were coloring. Uh, in fact, over the years, my use of color has changed. But, and it's more, I, I, the color is really now a kind of, it's part of the structure of the drawing. Um, you can see how I'm using the color to, to enhance the readability of the drawing. And I, I, something that I learned from in Albers, from the Albers Color Course, Albers used to talk about something being a color world, and which was like a, a group, a constellation of colors that, gave, that cohered in a certain kind of way. And if you look, you know, like, when it, like say the musical instrument pictures over here, you can see the banjo is one color world, the saxophone is a different color world, the drum is another color world, and the cymbal is a different color world. They both have their own unities of color. They, each one of them has their unities of color to try and define them. And again, if you look at every picture, there's, each picture is, is trying to conjure a specific... So although I, use, I realize I can use any color to do anything I want, once I start a color, it starts to dictate the other colors. I, I can use this or can't use that. I can use, I can get rid of the original color too, but I, but so, but the, the colors have to be pulled together simultaneously. I think I've, I've gotten the go ahead to open it out to questions and I'm sure there are many. So um, I think we'll end our conversation here. It's been delightful. Um, well, thank you so and much. Thank you. And um, <laughs> and we'll take questions from the audience. Unless we frightened everybody so much. <laughs> Uh, the color world, the flowers there, the flowers are black. The background is yellow, so yes. you reversed, well, the, the, you reversed what is. 
yes, that's, that's, yes, I, th that's a nice little play, thank you. <laughs> they're, but, they're, but they're also, they're also to do, they are also the national flower of the Ukraine, and the Ukrainian flower, uh, the Ukrainian flag is blue and yellow, and it's my Ukrainian painting. Um, I, during uh, COVID lockdowns, we were only able to go to the supermarket. And when we, I went to the supermarket, for the first, I started to look at fruit, vegetables, and flowers differently. I'd never drawn what you might call natural objects. I've always done manufactured objects. And then I looked at, and I was looking down the supermarket and I thought, these are just as manufactured as iPhones and trainers and everything else. Because we have invented these, we've bullied these poor things into coming out so they're all the same. The apples all look identical. Nature doesn't really do that. We have done that. And so, and, there's, and, and you know, it's just like everything else. There's 10 vegetables you can name instantly. There's 10 fruit you can name instantly. There are 10 flowers you can, we, these are all the domesticated things. We have, these are as f fabricated as the other things. So I started to draw, that's where the grapes came from, that's where the flowers came from. Uh, I've done fruit, and, uh, and they sit perfectly happily with the other things, I think, because we've, we've again, they are as manufactured in, but I mean, I don't mean to be critical about that because that is our function. We are meant to do this. We do, we, we are not going against nature when we do any of this. this. It is our nature to do that. We are doing, we don't even have a choice. This is what we do. You're affirming that not, my viewing the grapes as strange is uh, as intended. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd like to just say thank, thank you all very much for coming. It was very nice that you were here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.